Oh my God, it has to be, um, my dad had an Apple computer and it was a big deal because it was, it was the 90s, like early 90s and nobody had it yet. Um, I feel like I didn't understand what the internet was. I normally played a bunch of like Disney games that were like Disney edutainment games that were like, oh, how many like apples yeah. did Aladdin steal yeah. for Jasmine? <laughs> so um, I played a lot of like disc games like that and yeah. I feel like to me, I thought that was the internet. Um, I didn't realize oh, okay. that that was like the computer, but like this game was the internet. But then I think I played like this flash game online and it, I think it was called Munchies, which sounds real crazy, <laughs> but um, it was like the first like flash game. So I, I obviously played around with the internet with um, like AIM yep. and uh, that type of thing, like chatting, but it was a lot more for school. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of like having to use Encarta and stuff like that. So to me, yeah, like um, where it's like an online encyclopedia oh, where you cool. learn to reference things mm -hmm. when you write book reports and stuff. And for me, the internet wasn't like fun. It was definitely made for like school and library related things. So the first time I felt like, oh my God, like this is the internet, like it connected me to the world was when I played this bizarre flash game, like I said, mm -hmm. called Munchies, like, where you're basically like eating, it's basically fishy, like you just get bigger and bigger as you eat yeah, like these yeah. things on the screen. and. I realized it was the internet because whenever my dial-up would fail, it would fail. And that's when I realized, uh, like, oh, like, I get it now. Like, the game connection and all those things need to have to kind of be in the same, like, ecosystem. And that was a big deal for me because I feel like I understood for the first time almost, like, the meta that it was the internet. And I was kind of young for it, so I was just like, oh, okay, this is where, like, the gateway is to the world. Um, kind of bizarre. Like I said, a lot of it had to do with education, so it wasn't, in, like, instantly, like, oh, I'm having, like, so much fun with the internet. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Content creating is in a very weird universe right now, I'd say. Um, definitely, it sucks because you have to treat it like a business, right? Like, it, you want it to be an art and you want to simply be a creator, but at the end of the day, you have to have an audience and you do have to sell it in one way, shape, or form to people. So, I feel like as much as the motivation and ambition comes from wanting to create whatever your own personal form of entertainment or art is, you have to brand yourself and you have to make it easy for people to recognize you and find you and understand what it is that you do just by quickly looking at you. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that like brand awareness and savviness, although that sounds so business, no, it's, it's, it's so yeah. important. Like, um, I feel like a lot of my success is in part due to the fact that it's very easy to understand what I do just by looking at me. Um, I have like blonde hair and I'm Japanese and I translate anime so it's all kind of in the same like world and it's not difficult to like look at me and be like oh that's the one that does the anime stuff and that's all you really need to at least have that connection and I feel like when you create content you have to decide whether you are going to be the subject or if something else is going to be the subject. And I think that is what you have to just kind of cleanly decide early on, which is so hard. Like, how can you know yourself? It's like asking a high school student what you want to do for like the rest of your career. So it's tough, but um, yeah, that's my number one suggestion. Like really like look at what you are as a whole and what you want to put out there and see if it kind of works together in like a clean sentence. Mm. Basically, if you can explain what you do in like two sentences, mm. you're good to go. She got you got yeah. that brand. You're yeah. very yeah. You got the brand, the business side yeah. of it. You've really locked that into play. No, no, yeah, good for you. Like it is. A, it's a huge like. There's there's nothing more that you can be doing. Like that's really what you need to be doing now, yeah. isn't it? Not only is it the content that you create, but the way that you connect to your yeah. audience as well, and the exactly. way that you present yourself and present your brand, yeah. isn't it? Especially with like the nerd culture, there's so mm -hmm. much ability now to kind of like have these like subcultures and these like mini diverse things that you could be doing and there's definitely an audience for it. It's just kind of a matter of tapping into it. So it's kind of cool. If you're into what you're making, you'll know most about it and you'll know where the audience is. So it mm -hmm. kind of helps, but yeah, it's tough. Man, okay, cosplay is weird. Um, I feel like... It has expanded so much in the past five years, even since I have kind of 
stopped doing it so much. Um, I started really young. It was really just for fun. I really love Pokemon and I really love like video games. So I wanted to just be those characters, especially because in anime and video games, like they're so artistically and stylistically specific that you're not gonna look like them with the big eyes and all those things, but it's really fun to kind of like get their outfit right. And um, my mom is a pretty big artist. Like she is a, a traditional, like fine classical artist. So I had a lot of wanting to do crafts with my hands because of her. However, I will say, um, it's taken a different and interesting route. I love that it is so in your face and everybody's doing it and open, but when I was into it, it was definitely more embarrassing. And it was more like, you have to make your own thing because no one's gonna make it for you. And you can't let other people know what you're into because that's like a little bit too weird. It's like, um, I remember being like crazy into Cardcaptor Sakura, but a little bit, like I was a little bit too old for it. And I'm like, I don't wanna tell people I'm watching these like two middle schoolers fall in love and catch cards at night. Like it's hard to explain. So I was just like, yeah, I just, you know, it's a Halloween costume. Yeah. So I feel like, yeah. yeah. So you'd blame it on when yeah, you didn't wanna get caught. It's Halloween, Halloween in God. April. Like, There are quite a lot of highlights. Um, nostalgia highlights, I would have to say, I'm realizing now, as I grew up a little bit in the industry more, um, that SourceFed really was a big deal. Um, mm -hmm. And I maybe took it for granted a little bit during the time because now I look back on the videos and especially like BTS videos, it's so functional. And uh, we all kind of had the same agenda and that's extremely rare. So seeing that definitely is a highlight because I'm like, oh, this is where I learned everything and I can't believe this was like that big and it touched that many hearts and it like was shown on so many screens across everybody's homes. So that like reality is a big deal, kind of coming to terms with that. Um, but for me personally, I'd say, because um, anime is a big, t big part of my life, I got to voice in the original Japanese production of an anime in Japanese. Oh, wow. So that was definitely one of the biggest deals. Um, Japan is very bizarre, the way they handle business, especially entertainment, and um, IP is very, very, muddled over in Japan, which is why licensing is always kind of problematic and a big deal, which is also why Ready Player One was an issue, because Ultraman is a problem and Japan will not release Ultraman. Oh, um, really? Yeah, it's actually Japan's fault. <laughs> that it's was, like, Japan's wonky. fault. <laughs> <laughs> Godzilla and Ultraman like, can't be in the movie under different contexts with other people because of their licenses, and they have a legacy license from the 70s, so yeah. It's, oh, yeah. there know, you it's go. Crazy. Fun yeah. facts with Reina. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, so being in like that anime industry mm -hmm. from the US side and then kind of like almost infiltrating and being able to be a part of the Japanese production was a very big deal for me and it was very nerve wracking and scary but uh, yeah, definitely one of the biggest things to ever happen in my career because at the end where the end credits go, all there are all these Japanese names and then there's Raina Scully in English, which I'd asked on purpose for so yeah, that was a big deal. <laughs> quite different. It's seeming to be getting a little bit closer to what it is more in the West, but um, it's definitely still more nerdy. Japan's really interesting because um, there are two sides to it where anime, manga, those things, although they're cartoons, Japan doesn't really consider them cartoons or its own different medium. It's just a different type of entertainment. So adults read manga on the train, like these businessmen are like watching Berserk and anime and everything, and it's really, really quite normal over there. But um, gaming, I would say, is done often, like obviously in handhelds and at home, but it's not as nearly openly competitive the way esports is mm -hmm. here. I mean, I'm sure there is, and it exists, of course, because it's Asia, mm -hmm. but um, it's not as like celebrated the way sports is over there. Um, I feel like gaming is still a little bit more inside, um, and with the help of other nerd cultures like anime, there's a lot of like making fun of it and introspecting in a really fun way. So everyone gets to kind of be in on the inside joke of like, oh, I'm an otaku at home and I play games by myself. But because there are so many tropes about it that ended up being very funny and they're utilizing it really well in anime, I feel like it is kind of bleeding into 
normal culture the way the Western society is. It's just a little bit slower. Japan's really archaic, mm -hmm. much like the way I explained how they do business. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of don't ask and therefore don't tell kind of things going on in there. Oh, um, it sounds like I would love Japan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, really, it's interesting because like Japan seems so in your face with their mm -hmm. bizarreness and their like variety shows and their games and stuff. But the reality is like when you go there, it's actually like Hit, not hidden, but it's under like one layer of something else. And there's kind of like a politeness layer that covers it and you don't really get to feel it entirely. But um, but then if you go to like Akihabara, which is like electric town, literally the mecca of uh, video game and anime, it's, it's very different. It's very front facing. So, wow. so yeah. I'm a big uh, slice of life comedy fan. I'm I'm into action and drama and like fantasy, but it's I kind of have to like recalibrate my brain for those things. But um, slice of life really gets me. I would say this current season, Asobi Asobase is very fun. Chio School Road is incredible, and um, I believe things like Nichijo and Daily Lives of High School Boys just got added into Crunchyroll's queue, so I'm watching that right now. Mm -hmm. And otherwise, obviously, Attack on Titan and MHA. Like you have to. Like, Your name has a lot to do with Japanese culture, and it's actually very subtle, and it's really laced in there. And it has a lot to do with how a city kid grows up versus like a country bumpkin. And um, who a what? is a country bumpkin? A country bumpkin. Yeah, that's what uh, that's what Inaka people are called, as in people that are just like born off to uh, like out of the cities and normally in like a farming village yeah. or town. And uh, usually those Inaka families have a little bit more of a stronger tie to Shinto Buddhism. Mm. And Japan isn't really tremendously religious necessarily. They're, it's just more about tradition. And it very subtly goes into it and explains how it's really alive in everyday culture. But nobody's like necessarily sitting down and praying or going, going to a church. Like the bar of entry for that religion isn't that high. So I feel like it really shows you how they live their daily lives while having this kind of really powerful tradition behind them and culture that really cultivated this whole country. And it's very interesting and very important, I think, to watch it in Japanese. Infinity War was amazing. I'm actually not the biggest superhero fan. Um, I love anime, obviously, yeah. and that superhero almost trope is very different in anime. It's actually like an overpowered concept, so I never liked it. It's always it, it always seemed kind of too easy of a scapegoat. Like, oh, I'm I just have superpowers. Obviously, that's not the case. There's obviously a huge history behind it, but uh, for how I saw it, it was very like just in your face like that. But um, the in Avengers is really different. Um, the way they have paced, obviously, the whole story is kind of crazy, and now like we're kind of growing up with it, so yeah. that's really, like, it's very mesmerizing. But Infinity War, I was able to follow each of the micro stories, which mm -hmm. is kind of rare for me. I'm always like, what's the overall thing that's <laughs> happening? What, what are the space <laughs> politics right now? Um, but with this one, it was easy to follow. The action was incredible. Uh, the introduction and like lacing in like the whole Wakanda, like that Black Panther concept was done so well. And I think a mark of a good movie is being like, you cannot wait for the next one. What's going to happen to Shuri, my favorite character? My favorite character. I know no, she's not an Avenger. I don't care. She's my favorite character. <laughs>